Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IES. This is your next session of the ongoing Target Prelims 2024 series for Prelims 2024 that is going to be held on the 16th of June. I hope you are doing well and I really hope your preparation is going right on track. As you know, in this series, every single evening at 7 p.m., we have a session for you where we discuss some of the most prominent and the most important questions that can be asked in this year's prelims examination. Every single day, you have about 25 questions being discussed here. Today, we will be beginning with international relations. We have two sessions of international relations today and tomorrow. In both these classes, we'll be discussing 25 questions each. As you know, questions from international relations mostly are from the current affairs part. So when you read the current affairs magazines, when you read the newspapers, you have to focus on the places in news, the treaties or agreements in the news, anything that is specifically between India and some other country, that is the point of international relations and those are the questions that are asked. There are a lot of map based questions as well. And this is what we'll be discussing. Now, what do I want you to do here? In order to get the most out of this session, I want you to have a pen and a paper with you. As I present the question to you, we'll give you 30, 40 seconds of time in each question. Look at that question, read the question, and then with your pen and a paper, write down the answer. Whatever you think is the answer that has to be done before I disclose the answer at the end. How many you get right? Tell me in the comment section so that we can get to know how well prepared you are and do not cheat. That will not be going to helpful for everyone. So take a pen and a paper, try and write answers to each and every question as we go ahead and in the comment section, do let me know how many did you get right? I hope all of you are ready. So let's begin with the first one. The first question is on the Chabahar port that was in the news. The question goes, Consider the following statements with regard to Chabahar port. Number one, it is Iran's only oceanic port. Number two, there are two main ports in Chabahar, the Shahid Kalantri port and the Shahid Behishti port. Third, in May 2016, India, Iran and Russia signed a trilateral agreement to establish the International Transport and Transit Corridor, also known as the Chabahar Agreement. How many of these given statements are correct? I'll give you about 20 to 30 seconds of time. Think about it and then write the answer. The reason why this question is asked is that the Chabar port is in the news. There's a long editorial on Chabar port, how the operations have begun, how India, despite all these sanctions from the US, continued to fund the Chabar port and it has now reached the stage of operations. Chabar port, as you know, is extremely important because it allows India to reach Afghanistan bypassing Pakistan. So if we have to reach Afghanistan, Afghanistan is a landlocked country. So we can go to Chabar port and then have connectivity by road and rail to Afghanistan. So I hope all of you have written your answer. You have to tell how many of these out of the three statements are correct. Let's see. First, Chabar is Iran's only oceanic port. So it's only it's the only port that opens towards the ocean. This is absolutely correct. Yes, it is Iran's only oceanic port. Second, it actually has two main ports. So Chabar is not just one port. One is a Shahid Kalandri, another is Shahid Bahishti. That is also correct. Second statement is also right. Third, a trilateral agreement was signed between India, Iran and Russia. No. There was a trilateral agreement, but it was not Russia. Any guesses which was the third country? Think of it in your mind and let's see if you can get it right. Any guesses which was the third country? The third country was actually Afghanistan. Now, this is not the Taliban era Afghanistan that we are talking about. In 2016, we had a Talib we had Afghanistan government. We had elections. There was presence of the American troops in Afghanistan. That was a time that the trilateral agreement was signed. Today's Taliban does not have a connection with the Chabar port, although they have appreciated and they have spoken in favor of the port. They have spoken about how it will help them connect to India. But that agreement was at that time signed between the Afghanistan government, the democratic government that existed at that point of time. So the answer here is any two are correct. 
I hope you got this one right. First and second are correct. The third statement here is wrong. Why? Because again, Russia should not be the country here. It should be Afghanistan. So that was question number one. Now question number two. If the Japanese call them the Senkaku Islands, what do the Chinese call them? Difficult question, slightly tricky. See, first, the Aou Islands. Second, the Aoyutai Islands. Third, the Yangon Islands. And fourth, the Taiping Islands. Think of it. 30 seconds of time. Take your time and see which of these would be the one. Usually, whenever two countries have some issue on a territory, specifically with China, when China has an issue with that another country or a territory, Chinese will give a different name to that territory and the other country will have a different name for that territory. For example, you would have seen in the news the Chinese have renamed a lot of villages in Arunachal Pradesh. The reason why they do that is when you rename a certain area in your own language, you want to send out a signal that this is our territory, this is our area. And similar is the case here. So the Chinese have these issues of islands with uh, Japan. They have some issues with Taiwan as well. That is what the question is. So again, Japanese call them the Senkaku Islands. What do the Chinese call them? The answer here is A. It is the Yahoo Island. So it is the same set of islands. Does that the Chinese call them by a different name and the Japanese call them by a different name. Interestingly, the same islands are called by this name by Taiwan. So again, these are the islands where not just China and Japan are fighting over it. In fact, Taiwan also says that this is actually our territory. If you look at Taiwan and the demand that Taiwan makes from Taiwan's point of view, entire China is their territory. They think that the mainland belongs to them. They are the real true rulers. And that is why any territory with which China has an objection or China has a dispute, Taiwan makes its own. What about these two? These two are islands in the South China Sea. South China Sea, as you know, have a, has a lot of islands, a lot of them natural, some of them man-made as well. Chinese have been creating these man-made islands in the South China Sea to ensure that around these islands, they can claim the 200 nautical mile zone as the exclusive economic zone so that they can export resources from that area. The answer here anyways would be A. I hope you got that one right as well. Moving on to the third question. Which of the following nations share a land boundary with Yemen, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Oman and Qatar? Think about it. Take 30 seconds of your time and then answer this question. Imagine the map in your mind and then see Yemen shares a boundary with which of these. Why is Yemen in the news? As you know, there is a civil war going on in Yemen for a long time. Also, the reason why it is in the news is because of the Houthis and their attack in the Red Sea. In the past few months, a lot of merchant vessels in the Red Sea have been attacked by the Houthis of Yemen. Houthis is a group that is being supported by Iran. They are fighting against the Yemen government. America and many other countries, in fact, have come together to try and have a coalition to fight against the Houthis to have a presence in the Red Sea. All that kept in mind, Yemen is an important country for this year's examination. So you should know its location. You should know which are the countries that share a boundary with it. So again, try and see what can be the answer. UAE, Saudi Arabia, Oman and Qatar. If you imagine the map, you would be able to realize that Qatar is in a very different direction. So is the UAE. Both of these are in a very different direction. I'll just show you the map so that it becomes clear. See, this is Yemen. The only two countries that share a land border with Yemen is Oman and Saudi Arabia. So the answer here has to be two and three only. Where is the UAE? This is where UAE is. What about Qatar? Qatar is even smaller. This is where Qatar is. So Qatar, UAE, both of these are at a very different place. They do not border the Red Sea. They are not connected to the Red Sea. It is Yemen and South. It is Saudi Arabia and Oman. 
these are the two countries that share a land border with Yemen. For this year's examination, Yemen and the Red Sea, both of these are extremely important places. You need to know for both of these, which are the countries that share a land border. So do make a note of this. I hope you are done with this. Next question number 51. The 1951 Refugee Convention talks about the core principle of non-refoulement. Non-refoulement principle refers to which of the following? Number one, the home nation of the refugee must ensure his or her safety. Second, a refugee should not be returned to a country where they face serious threats to their life or freedom. Third, the United Nations will form a tribunal to resolve this matter of the refugees. Or fourth, the destination country has a right to reject any refugee application. Take 30 seconds, think about it and then answer or write in your paper what should be the answer according to you. Principle of non-refoulement. Refugee convention or question about refugees, these topics are always in the news. Sometimes it's with respect to the Rohingyas. Sometimes it's with respect to the Citizenship Amendment Act in India. Sometimes about what is happening in Europe, people coming in. As you know, Britain recently had signed a deal with Rwanda. Under which if people come into Britain illegally and they try to apply for asylum, what Britain will do is they will send all those people to Rwanda and they will stay in Rwanda till that time that the application in Britain is processed. Only after the application is decided only then the people will be allowed to come back. In that aspect, non-refoulement principle is important. So again, what exactly is non-refoulement? Which of these is correct? The correct answer here has to be B. The principle of non-refoulement says a refugee should not be returned to a country where they face serious threats to their life or freedom. Now, if you look at with respect to India, for example, India is not a signatory to this refugee convention. However, despite not being a signatory, India has always followed the principles of this convention. There are multiple examples from that. Take a look at what happened in East Pakistan before the Bangladesh war started. There were lakhs and lakhs of people who came to India illegally. India was not a rich country at that point of time. We had lack of resources, lack of water, a lack of food. We could have very easily said that no, you can go back to your country. We won't allow you here. But India followed the principle of non-refoulement. Non-refoulement principle again meant that we will not send you back to a country where your life is in danger. That is how non-refoulement works. So again, India followed this principle. If a person is running away from their country because their life is in danger in their country, wherever they come to, they should not be or they cannot be sent back forcefully. It is applicable to those countries that are signatory of refugee convention. But as I said, countries such as India are not a signatory to the refugee convention, but we still follow this. You can take example of Rohingyas issue as well. The government of India accept that there are many Rohingyas living in India right now, but we have not forcefully asked them to leave. Similarly, we have a lot of Tamil refugees from Sri Lanka who have come to India who are living here illegally or at least were living here illegally in the beginning. India did not forcefully send them back. All these are in line with the non refoulement principle that if we know if we send you back, your life would be in danger. So even if you have come here illegally, you have come here because your life is in danger. That is why we will protect you. We will not forcefully send you back. So the answer here was B. Moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements with regards to the South China Sea. Number one, in May 2019, the Indian Navy for the first time conducted joint exercises with the US, Japanese and Philippines navies in the South China Sea. Second, in May 2023, India for the first time sent warships to participate in a two day joint exercise with the navies of seven ASEAN states in the South China Sea. Third, in 2016, the UN clause arbitral 
ट्रिब्यूनल रूल्ड दैट चाइनाज नाइन डैश नाइन क्लेम हैड अ साउंड लीगल बेसिस हाउ मेनी ऑफ दीज स्टेटमेंट्स आर करेक्ट थिंक अबाउट इट टेक थर्टी सेकेंड ऑफ योर टाइम एंड देन टेल मी दी आंसर यू कैन मेक अ नोट इन योर पेपर एज वेल South China Sea, as you know, always remains in the news because of the territorial dispute between China and the neighboring countries. China has made their own line called the Nine Dash Line. Now, Nine Dash Line does not have any scientific basis of dash. Just that when China released their official map, they just made nine dashes to make a line, something like this. So they just made a line like this, so it became a Nine Dash Line. no other version of it india is not directly involved there india does not share a border with the uh, south china sea but countries that do share a border with south china sea be it philippines be it uh, vietnam etc india does have good relationship with them done okay first statement indian navy for the first time take took part in the joint exercise with us japan philippines in 2019 this is absolutely correct india does not speak about the south china sea directly but we have taken part in joint exercises in this part of the world second is also true in may 2023 india had even sent warships to participate in again joint exercise along with navies of seven asean countries Or what the third one? Third one actually is wrong. On the contrary, the UN clause in 2016 said that the Nine Dash Line had no legal basis. So in 2016, there was a case filed by Philippines against the US. Philippines is one of those countries that says that China is not allowing it to use its own exclusive economic zone EEZ. because china claims the entire south china sea as their area the reasoning that china gives is that historically whichever dynasty has ruled over china has controlled the south china sea as well so they say that south china sea belongs to us that is why china has been building multiple artificial islands as well in the south china sea so that they can claim 200 nautical mile area around each of these islands as an exclusive economic zone this case when philippines went to un clause in 2016 this was decided against chinese the un clause that is the united nation convention on the law of the sea that is headquartered in jamaica they gave an order that there is no legal basis of this nine dash line however did it make any difference to china's approach absolutely not it did not make any difference to their approach they said whatever you want to do you can keep on doing this is our area we will not give it up now what has india done as i told you india has never directly spoken against or anything about the south china sea but we do try and maintain relationships with countries in this region philippines for example famously plays its order for brahmos Recently, just a few weeks back, India supplied the first set of Brahmos missiles to Philippines, and Philippines specifically intends to use these missiles to counter China in the South China Sea. Vietnam also is one of those countries. They are trying to explore hydrocarbons in the South China Sea, and they want India's help. They have contacted ONGC multiple times, requesting ONGC to take up these exploration projects. So India. does not speak up against china in that issue but it's not that we are silent we are forming relationships with countries involved in this dispute so the answer here will be b any two are correct the third one here is wrong i hope you got this one right as well let's move on to the next question then straight forward simple which of the following organizations publishes the asia development outlook report World Bank, ASEAN, Asian Development Bank, or AIIB, that is Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Think about it. Take ten twenty seconds and then write the answer in your copy. This was a recent report that came out. 
comparing countries in Asia, their development. It again talked about India being the fastest growing major economy in terms of percentage. The answer here is Asian Development Bank, ADB. Asian Development Bank has financed a lot of projects in India, a lot of infrastructure projects. The most interesting part about this bank is, although the name might be Asian Development Bank, but that does not mean that only Asian countries are member here. In fact, USA is one of the largest sh shareholders in the Asian Development Bank. So USA is almost everywhere. Whenever these reports come out in current affair magazines, etc., you will be reading about a lot of reports. Whenever these reports come out, just make a table and make a note of who is the publisher of this report. These kind of questions are asked by the UPSC. Especially reports published by, let's say, WTO, World Bank, IMF. These are especially important. Reports published by them are asked by the UPSC. They might ask you inside of the report as well, trends that are displayed in the report. But many times they just ask you who publishes this report. So it's a pretty simple, straightforward question to answer. The answer here was C. Let's move on to the next one. The Brandt line introduced by the former German Chancellor Willy Brandt in the 1980s visually represents which of the following? Number one, partition between East and West Germany. Number two, divides the capitalist and communist countries of the world. Number three, circumferences the nations with most civil wars. Fourth, the global north-south division. Think about it. It's a lot in the news. Take a few seconds and then mark your answer. The brand line. It's an imaginary line drawn on the map. It is a lot in the news. The answer here is the global north-south divide. You would have seen a lot of leaders, including our prime minister, talking about the global south. In simple terms, north is the word that is used to refer to developed nations. South is the word that is used to refer to developing or least developed countries. It was believed that for the south to grow, to progress, north should come and help them. North should fulfill the responsibility of supporting them. But increasingly, we have seen that rather than the developed world helping the developing world, developing world are coming together in what we call a South-South cooperation. We saw Global South Summit being held. We saw in the G20 Summit also our Prime Minister speaking about the Global South. The Prime Minister and many of his speeches have spoken about the Global South, India being the leader of the Global South, so on and so forth. This is the division. This is that line. So again, this is the imaginary line. Now, usually many people would say that this line would divide basically uh, the entire globe into north and south. However, the fact is that even in the south, you will see countries that are considered as a global north. For example, Australia, Singapore, India also. So it's not that the entire world is divided on the base of the equator. It's a north-south question, but north-south is not just because the location of the country is as such. The name has been given because most of the countries that belong to developing world or that belong to least developed come to the south and most of the developed world comes in the north, but that is not always the case. Do remember that is called the Brandt line. It's an imaginary line. <clears throat> there is no scientific basis for it. It is not uh, on the base of certain calculations as such. It's just a normal line drawn by the German Chancellor in 1980s. Next question. Consider the following statements with respect to NATO. Number one. Since its founding, Article 5 of the treaty has never been invoked. Second. In 2006, NATO defense ministers agreed to a commitment that 2% of their country's GDP would be allocated towards defense spending. Third, 
NATO's protection even extends to countries' civil wars or internal coups. Read this carefully. Mark your answer. Take 15, 20, 30 seconds and then we'll discuss. Read this carefully. Mark your answer. NATO, as you know, usually always remains in the news. Now it is more so in the news because of the Ukraine-Russia war, because of the role that they have been playing, their support to Ukraine. Let's look at this first statement. Article 5 has never been invoked. Now what exactly is Article 5? Article 5 is the most famous article of this treaty. It is this article because of which smaller countries want to become a part of NATO. This article simply says an attack on any one of these members is equal to an attack on each member. In simple terms, if any country attacks even one of the members of NATO, all of them together will come to safeguard that country. All of them will come to retaliate. So it's a concept of one for all, all for one. This is article number five. So the first statement says this article five has never been invoked. Is it true? No, it's actually wrong. It has been invoked only once. When World Trade Center attack. The World Trade Center attacks, the famous September 11 attacks, 9-11 attacks of the US after which the US decided to invade Afghanistan. This is when not just the US, but all the NATO forces went to Afghanistan. So NATO participated in this war in Afghanistan. It was not just the US. That was because of article number five, because an attack on one was considered as an attack on everyone. Second, in 2006, NATO defense ministers committed 2% of the country's GDP would be allocated to defense spending. This is actually correct. So there are two ways to look at it. Although they did commit it, but most members or most nations have not really implemented it. Most nations have not implemented it. That is why when Donald Trump became the American president, he started saying that NATO should spend more. Why is the Americans only spending so much on NATO? He was against NATO countries being dependent so much on the US. If you look at the NATO defense spending today, more than half of it alone is spent by the US. US has obviously the biggest budget, the biggest military, that is obviously a given. But most of the countries do not fulfill their obligation of spending 2%, although they did agree to that. Third, NATO's protection even extends to members civil war internal coups? No. Wrong. Meaning that if in a member country of NATO, there is an internal civil war, there is an internal coup, there is an issue between within their own country, then other members will not come for help. The article number five or this treaty of protecting each other, it only extends to external attacks. If within their country, they have an issue, they have a civil unrest, then the members will not come for help. So first is wrong. Third is also wrong. Only the second one is correct. The answer here has to be a, any one. So slightly tricky, but I hope most of you got this right. First and third are wrong. Only the second statement here is correct. Okay, good. Let's move on then. Consider the following statements with regards to the Kachathivu Islands. Again, it was in the news. First, historically, the Raja of Ramnad or present day, present day Ramanathapuram in Tamil Nadu is said to have owned the island. Indian fishermen and pilgrims enjoy access to the island without the need to obtain travel documents or visa. Third, the Kachadivu island is an uninhabited island. How many of these are correct? Think about it, take a few seconds and then mark your answer. As you know, Kachatiwo Island is towards the south of India. If you go south from Kanyakumari, this is an island on which there were territorial disputes between India and Sri Lanka. It was in 1974 that India agreed that I, this 
आइलैंड बिलोंग्स टू श्रीलंका 1974 there was an agreement sign of maritime boundary between the two sides and this island was in the sri lankan territory it's in the news why because the government is making allegation that congress government of that time handed over india's territory that's why it is in the news so it is with respect to that island that we have this question first the ruler of ramanathpuram in tamil nadu owned this island this is actually true this is correct second indian fishermen and pilgrims can go to this island without the need of any visa this is true so indian fishermen in fact are the ones that are the unhappiest because of this island going to sri lanka indian fishermen even today use this island when they are basically down in the ocean for fishing they still use this island to sort out their net to rest for some time and then they come back so because it is sri lankan territory a lot of time these are caught uh, the fishermen are caught by the sri lankan navy because they are entering the sri lankan waters that becomes a problem for them third it is an uninhabited island means no one lives there no population this is actually true no one lives there there is no population the reason is there is no source of drinkable water It's a very very small island, surrounded by the Indian Ocean. So you have ocean salty water, but you don't have fresh water to drink. Since there is no source of fresh water, there cannot be any life there. So it does not have any population. Interestingly, it does have a church. So it does have a church, although it does not have any uh, population. And in this church, there are some events that are organized, some festivals are organized, and that is when the pilgrims go. so pilgrims from india from sri lanka both the sides go to this island but it's only once or twice a year because no one lives on that island so the answer here would be all three are correct c all these three are correct statements i hope you got this right let's move on to the next one the order of drug galpo recently in the news is the highest civilian honor of which of the following nations greece denmark bhutan or sweden think about it it was in the news recently order of drug galpo you know uh, in the past few years our prime minister has gotten the civilian honors from many countries whenever for example he makes a foreign visit you will see in the news that he is being conferred that highest civilian honor so it's it has become pretty common now although it is still important the answer here is bhutan see india and bhutan share a very close relationship we have been helping bhutan with a lot of stuff including help with their budget giving them subsidies helping them with the infrastructure building a lot of hydro carbon hydro power projects rather in bhutan have been made by india Bhutan has a lot of uh, potential of generating electricity but infrastructure and investment required has been given by India similarly Bhutan to return the favor honored our prime minister with their highest civilian honor recently and that is why it is in the news let's move on to the next one consider the following statements with regards to united nations security council reforms number 1 the unsc reforms require an amendment to the charter of the un procedure for which is set in article 108 of the un charter second in the first stage general assembly where each of 193 member states have one vote must endorse the reform with two thirds majority equivalent to at least 128 seats or states third in the second stage upon approval in the first stage the un charter considered an international treaty undergoes amendment how many of these are correct think about it it's a long question mark your answer and then we'll discuss over the past few years talks about un security council reform have been very very regular 
India along with countries such as Japan, Germany, Brazil, they are seeking reforms in the UN Security Council. However, because of one reason or the other, it has not been happening. Now, UN Security Council reforms can only happen by amending the UN Charter. It's similar to amending our constitution. Just like we have our constitution, UN has its own charter and you have to amend by writing how many members will there be or how many permanent members will be there be, what will be the power, so on and so forth. It has been amended in the past. It's a difficult process, but it has been amended. Earlier, the non-permanent members that we have used to be much lesser. They were increased to 10 now. So UN Security Council, as you know right now, has five permanent and 10 non-permanent members. But permanent members, that change has not been done. Let's look at this first statement. The procedure for the amendment is written in Article 108 of the UN Charter. That is absolutely true. This is the case. Second, in the first stage, the UN General Assembly votes and they need to have two third votes. That is actually true. And I'll tell you one more very interesting fact. In the first stage, because the vote is happening in the General Assembly only, there is no veto. So the permanent members of security council obviously do vote because they are members of general assembly also so they will also vote but in the first stage if a permanent member of security council votes against it that will not be considered as a veto because their veto power is in the security council and not in the general assembly third second stage is when the united nation charter uh, basically undergoes the change it's after voting in the security council that is also true all these three are correct it's a difficult process because general assembly by two-thirds and then after it security council also by two-thirds have to say yes in the second stage this is where the problem begins it is at the second stage that veto power also comes into picture this is one of the reasons why you will see india for example tries to maintain good relationship with every country in the world, doesn't matter what their size is. We want to maintain good relationship even with the smaller countries, smaller island nations, because every country at the end of the day has one vote in the General Assembly. So when it comes to votes such as these, even small countries matter. It's not just the large or the big countries and that is why we maintain good relationship with them as well. The answer here would be any, all three are correct. Next question, which of the following nation is planning to build a new regional economic hub, Gelefu, Nepal, Myanmar, Cambodia or Bhutan? Think about it. I'll give you a few seconds. Think, mark your answer and then we'll discuss. New regional economic hub, Gelefu. The answer here again is Bhutan. In the past few years, Bhutan has been trying to expand its economic sources. For many years, for a long time, Bhutan has been focused on not interfering with its environment. Whenever it, uh, any project is being signed, they usually stay away from it. For example, if you remember, there was talks of BBIN project. Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal transit project. So the same truck, for example, can go to all these countries for transportation, etc. Bhutan walked out of it. Bhutan said that no, it will harm our environment. We don't want to be a part of it. So for many years, they have been away from all this development, etc. They said that we want to give more importance to a sustainable living. However, now what is happening with increasing population, new aspirations of the younger generation, Obviously, now they started looking for more jobs within their own country because Bhutan, very small country, does not have a lot of employment opportunities. So a lot of people move out of Bhutan for their jobs. US, Australia, Singapore, that is where they go to China also. So now Bhutan is helping or seeking help from countries such as India to build their own economic hub. And they are beginning with SEZ, Special Economic Zone being built in Gelefu. So this is again a plan that they have rolled out. They are seeking finance funds from it from countries such as India and help in the long run. Let's see how this turns out. The answer here is Bhutan. 
Next, let's move to Europe. After 15 years of negotiations, India recently signed a trade and economic partnership agreement with European Free Trade Association EFTA. This EFTA today includes which of the following countries? Denmark, Norway, Switzerland, Finland, Iceland and Liechtenstein. Now this is a tricky question. These are all similar sounding countries, but it was a big deal that India was able to sign this agreement. Think about it, mark your answer and then we'll discuss. European Free Trade Association, EFTA. All right. EFTA actually includes Norway, Switzerland, Iceland and Liechtenstein. Not an easy question to answer because there are so many groups. But as I told you, when government of India signs such kind of a treaty or agreement, this group becomes important, especially the members of the group, any specific objective do they want to achieve Do remember that the answer here is A. 2, 3, 5 and 6, Norway, Switzerland, Iceland and Liechtenstein. These are the four countries that are a part of European Free Trade Association. As the name suggests, these are the countries that want to ensure free trade amongst themselves beyond the EU parameters. Next question on India-Sri Lanka relations. Consider the following statements with regards to India-Sri Lanka relations. Number one. Sri Lanka has now adopted India's UPI service. Second, India Sri Lanka conduct joint military exercise Slinex and naval exercise Mitra Shakti. Third, Sri Lankan cabinet earlier cleared the Sinosaur E Tequin joint venture in India, a project from India, to execute renewable energy projects in these three islands of Sri Lanka, which has now been replaced by China which of these or how many of these are correct think about it and we'll then discuss as you know an increasing number of countries are either adopting upi or they are taking india's help to set up their own system similar to the upi which Sri Lanka relationship has improved considerably ever since India has held them come out of the economic crisis. Let's look at it. One, Sri Lanka has adopted India's UPI service. That is absolutely true. They have. Second, India, now second is a tricky one. India and Sri Lanka do have joint military exercise also, joint naval exercise also, but the names are not correct. The names in fact are opposite. Slinex is actually the naval service name and Mitra Shakti is the joint military exercise. So Mitra Shakti is a joint military one, Slinex is the naval one. So the second statement is wrong. Third is also wrong. Why? Because this joint venture was actually first signed with China. The joint venture was actually first signed with China. It was later on that India replaced China. Replaced by India. So third statement is also wrong. The answer has to be A. As you know, Sri Lanka is one of those countries that has been through what friendship with China looks like. They have understood how Chinese pressure of debt can actually ruin their country. Sri Lanka has been going through their own economic crisis ever since the COVID-19 pandemic hit or even before that. India has been helping Sri Lanka by giving them loans, by giving them line of credits also. And apart from that, some of the projects that Sri Lanka was supposed to do with China, they have been taken up by India, as you can see here as well. After the Hamban Tota port episode, when Hamban Tota port of Sri Lanka was built by China, Sri Lanka could not pay the money back and Chinese took over the lease for 99 years. 
Sri Lankan government has become much more careful and circumspect about the intentions of the Chinese and that is why they are happier to be partnering with India as compared to China. The answer here thus is A. First one is correct. Second and third are wrong. Next question. The Good Friday Agreement recently in the news was a peace agreement between which of the following pair of nations? Spain and Portugal, US and Mexico, Ireland and UK, Finland and Russia. Think about it. Not a difficult question if you have been reading the news. Done. The answer here is C, Ireland and UK. Now, Ireland and UK have had a very, uh, I should say, violent past. Ireland was also ruled by UK. The independence struggle of Ireland was not very was not very peaceful. Since then, there have been a lot of issues between the two sides. Good Friday Agreement was an agreement of peace between the two sides. However, even today, the relationship is not that great between the two. There are a lot of issues. There is religion involved. There is politics involved. For example, within Ireland, there have been clashes of Catholics versus the Protestants. So, for example, Catholics are the ones who believe that whatever is said in the church is right. However, the church interprets the Bible is right. Protestants, as the name suggests, protest against the authority of the church. They believe that the church's interpretation of the Bible may not be right. So, there is a lot of complex issues involved between Ireland and UK. There was a peace agreement signed between the two called the Good Friday Agreement. Next, consider the following statements with regards to India-UAE relations. Number one, both countries signed a pact on interlinking domestic debit and credit cards, Rupay, with Jaiwan. Second, UAE's domestic card Jaiwan is based on digital rupee credit and debit card stack. Third, India and UAE established diplomatic relations in 1972. How many of these are correct? Think about it, take your time and then mark the answer in your copy. UAE is an extremely important country for India. It usually remains one of the largest trading partners of India. If you look at India's largest trading partners, one, two, three is usually China, US and UAE. The ranking keeps on changing. So sometimes US may be one, China may be two, UAE may be three, but usually these are the top three. The ranking may keep on changing year on year. So UAE is a very, very important country for us. It has invested a lot of money in India as well. Many Indians work in the UAE. It has a very good relationship. Now, the interesting part is if you go back to a few years, a couple of decades back, UAE relation with India was not that great because they were always seen as being closer to Pakistan. They were always seen as a country that supported Pakistan's point of view over India. Whenever Pakistan talked about uh, Kashmir at the international forums, UAE used to support them. However, UAE also over the past few years have realized that if Pakistan supports terrorism, even UAE can be impacted by terrorism. Because of some of the terror attacks on UAE officials in UAE and outside their country, they have come to this realization that countries such as Pakistan supporting terrorism is bad for everyone. And since then, they have started to see India in much more positive light now. And since then, the relationship has improved drastically with bilateral visits from India to UAE, from UAE to India as well. In that aspect, the first statement is true. There has been interlinking of Rupay card with Jaiwan. Rupay card, as you know, is launched by NPCI, National Payment Corporation of India. That is also behind UPI. Second is also correct. Stack basically means algorithm or technology that can be replicated or a kind of a program or a code. For example, the UPI stack of India. So India, government of India, NPCI, they developed UPI. They have made it open 
companies can come and use the upi stack paytm phone pay google pay when they use upi they have not done their own invention npci has given them that this is the program this is the algorithm you can run and you can use upi so this is what stack is third is also right it was in 1972 so much after our independence that diplomatic relationship were established between the two sides the answer thus would be c all three here are correct i hope you got this right all three are correct next one which of the following nations share a boundary with the red sea i told you earlier red sea yemen both of these are important let's see if you remember from the last diagram jordan egypt turkey sudan and oman which of these share a boundary with the red sea think about that diagram that we saw and mark your answer then we'll come to it jordan egypt turkey sudan and oman see the easiest one to eliminate in this if you remember or if you have any idea about the map would be turkey turkey would be the easiest to eliminate considering its location then think of the others that you can eliminate if you remember we just saw the map of yemen in the beginning questions and we saw how yemen is connected to oman and saudi arabia so oman also is on the other side the answer here is jordan egypt and sudan that is 1 2 and 4 Jordan, Egypt, and Sudan. Look, look at this. So this is the Red Sea. It's in the news because of all these vessels being attacked. So Egypt is here. Now Jordan, it might not look like it, but Jordan does have a boundary with the Red Sea. So this is the area where Red Sea meets Jordan. Then we have Sudan. Here it is. There are other countries also that are connected to the Red Sea. There is Saudi Arabia here. <clears throat> as you can see there is yemen here there is eritrea here all of these are connected or they have a common boundary with the red sea so do remember that red sea yemen these are some of these places that are a lot in the news and map based questions on these are very 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 common next consider the following statements number 1 in line with india's neighborhood first policy 2425 budget allocated 2068 crore rupees foreign aid to bhutan second separate amount of 200 crore was given or set aside for african countries in the budget third nepal got the largest share of foreign aid in 2024 25 budget how many of these are correct think about it mark the answer in your copy and then we'll discuss so it's a common practice every single year in the budget the government of india allocates some money for our neighboring countries or for our friends that might require some assistance so it's nothing new the amount keeps on changing for example even after all this controversy with maldives even then in the budget some money is given for maldives even maybe for their help maybe for gifting them something but some money is set aside so it's a common practice you can call it a part of neighborhood first policy but even before the neighborhood first policy came up the government of india has been doing this it's nothing new first statement bhutan was given 2068 crore rupees yes absolutely true second african nations for them 200 crore was set aside that is also true third nepal got the largest share no almost every single year almost every single year the biggest aid is given to bhutan if you look at countries in our neighborhood the country that gets largest share of our uh, revenue largest share of our help is always bhutan in fact when we used to get lpg cylinders at a subsidy your cooking gas cylinder at a subsidy the government used to give the same subsidy to cylinders in bhutan as well so indian bhutan have a very very special very close relationship it's an open border you can go to bhutan by road without the requirement of a visa as you know 
Bhutan citizens can come to India also to work. Bhutan uh, has been given a lot of help by India in also the sense. See, small countries for them, it's difficult to maintain and establish their embassies. Running an embassy in different parts of the world is an expensive exercise. Bhutan does not have an embassy in most of the countries. They don't have an embassy in any of the P5 countries, for example. They have embassies in very handful of nations. In all the other countries, Bhutan works through the Indian embassy. So, for example, if in the US, there is a Bhutan citizen, he requires certain help or she requires certain help. They will rather contact the Indian embassy through which the help will be used. It's a very close special relationship. Bhutan right now is in talks with China to resolve their border dispute. India is helping in that manner as well. The answer here is B, any two are correct because first and second are correct. Third is wrong because it is Bhutan that has the largest foreign aid from India and not Nepal. Next question. Consider the following statements with regards to India, Myanmar free movement regime. Number one, the free movement regime is a mutually agreed arrangement between the two countries that allows tribes living along the border on either side to travel up to 16 kilometer inside the other country without a visa. Second, it was implemented in 2014 as part of the government of India's act East policy. Third, four northeastern states of India share a land border with Myanmar, Arunachal, Manipur, Mizoram and Nagaland. How many of these are correct? It was in the news quite a lot. India Myanmar relationship has been in the news. Free movement regime is in the news. So you should know about this. Take a few seconds, mark the answer and then we'll discuss. Myanmar, as you know, was ruled by the British, just like India. It was known as Burma. There are a lot of family connections on either side of the border. So there are many tribes in Myanmar whose family members are in India and the same is the case on the other side as well. That is why the tribes have been demanding free movement. Thus, the two sides agreed on something called the free movement regime. The reason why it is in the news is the government has decided to stop this now. It has been stopped. Why? Because of the issues in Manipur, there is uh, some evidence that suggests that the issues in Manipur are also connected to Myanmar. A lot of tribals coming in from Myanmar are taking part in this violence in Manipur. So the government has actually decided to stop it. First is true. Then it was in force. Tribes were allowed to move up to 16 kilometers from the border specifically to meet their family members because the family members lived on the other side. Second is wrong. The policy was implemented in 2018, not 2014. So it's not that old. 2018, government of India decided to launch this policy. Third, fourth states of India Arunachal, Manipur, Mizoram and Nagaland share a border with Myanmar. That is true. You should make a list of all the neighboring countries of India and see the states of India that share a border with them. For example, you should know which of the Indian states share a border with Nepal. You should know which of the Indian states share a border with Bangladesh, so on and so forth. That is important. These questions are asked regularly with Myanmar. It is in the news. It has a probability of being asked. The answer thus becomes B. Any two are correct. One and three. Second is wrong because the year given here is wrong. Next. Consider the following statements with regards to G77 or the group of 77. Number one. The group of 77 is the largest intergovernmental organization of developing countries in the UN. Second. India and China are members of G77. Third, in 1964, G77 came into existence when they signed a joint declaration during the first session of the UN Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva. How many of these are correct? Slightly tough, but the G77 group recently had a meeting. That's why it's interesting. Think about it. 
most of these are what you call as a global south done okay first g77 is the largest of intergovernmental organization of developing countries in the un that is true india and china part of it no so india is a part of g77 china is not so while india does see itself as a part of these developing countries group and that is precisely why india wants to establish itself as a leader of the developing world as leader of the global south because we believe that we are already in that group and we know what the group demands we know what the group seeks so we are a good fit here china is not a member here in 1964 it came into existence that is also true it was in 1964 that it first came into being the answer thus is two are correct one and three second one is wrong because as i said china is not a member india is a member china just like india is also looking to be that country that leads the developing world or leads the global south the reason why countries are so willing to lead this global south is because number one they will obviously have a much larger group they will have a backing of this group in the un it gives them opportunities to explore more markets in china's case because it's an export majority country it wants to explore as many markets as possible for its products china has humongous foreign reserves which it can use to give loans to these countries at attractive rates of interest it's a good use of chinese money as well on the other hand india wants to use it or india wants that platform as a leader of these countries to make sure that they support us in the un when india tomorrow for example would demand reforms in the un we want these countries to be on our on our side and that is why both the countries are kind of in this fight of who will lead the developing world the answer here is b next consider the following statements with regard to international court of justice number 1 it is the only principal organ of the un that is not in new york second it settles legal disputes between states and gives advisory opinion in accordance with international law on legal questions referred to it by authorized un organs and specialized agencies third the court has 15 judges who are elected on a, for a 9 year term by the general assembly and security council they vote simultaneously but separately how many of these are correct think about this it's a long question take a few seconds mark the answer and then we'll discuss the icj remains in the news because sometime or the other some high profile cases keep on going to international court of justice raise the judicial arm of the un india also right now has a judge in the international court of justice justice dalveer bhandari who remember the name okay first is correct out of all the principal organs of the un this is the only one not in new, uh, new york it's in netherlands it's in a place called the hague it's in netherlands second is also correct it resolves dispute between the states and the un agencies when they have an advisory uh, they want to ask for any advice advise the opinion they come to the court and advise the opinion is given to them third is also correct it has 15 judges 9 year term it's a renewable term Dalveer Bhandari uh, Indian judge is serving his second term it was very interesting when Dalveer Bhandari was being reelected he was fighting against a british judge there were multiple rounds of voting after which indian judge won when dalveer bhandari won his second term and uk judge british judge lost it was the first time ever that a permanent member of security council did not have any judge in this court so uk all five countries have always had at least one judge each except uk when the british judge lost and indian judge had won the answer here is c all these three are correct the name if you want is dalveer bhandari 
the Indian judge that is right now in this court. Next, Idi Amin, recently in the news, was a former president of which of the following nations? Interesting question. Idi Amin, he was recently in the news. South Sudan, Kenya, Uganda or Eritrea. Think of it. Interesting personality. He was in the news recently. Take 10 seconds. Mark your answer. Done. The answer here is Uganda. He was a former president of Uganda. Why is it in the news? Uganda <coughs> recently hosted the non-aligned movement summit. In this summit, the president of Uganda apologized to India because Idi Amin was a dictator. In 1970s, there were many Indians who used to live in Uganda. When Idi Amin became the president, he ordered all the Indians to leave leave your property, leave your belongings, leave the country, otherwise you will be killed. So thousands of Indians were forcefully moved out of Uganda. Their property was taken away. All their uh, belongings were taken away. The government later on appealed them to come back, but most of them did not come back. He was a dictator who killed thousands and thousands of people. For that, the Uganda government recently apologized to India in that NAM summit. That is why it's in the news. Do remember that Idi Amin was the president who forcefully sent Indians out in 1970s. Next question. Consider the following statements with regards to Indians locked up in foreign jails. Number one, India has signed agreements on transfer of prisoners with 31 countries under Indian prison under which Indian prisoners lodged in foreign countries will be transferred to India to serve the remainder of the sentence. Second, Indian Community Welfare Fund is set up by mission and post abroad to assist these Indian nationals. Third, India has also signed two multilateral conventions on transfer of sentenced persons, the Inter-American Convention on Serving Criminal Sentences Abroad and the Council of Europe Convention on Transfer of Sentenced Persons. How many of these are correct? It's a difficult question, I know. Not many of us read about foreigners who are or Indians who are in foreign jails. But this is a topic that came in the news because of the Indian Navy personals who were jailed, who were sentenced to death by Qatar. Then they were brought back to India later on. And that's why this topic has come in the news. Usually we don't read about this. So there are thousands, a few thousands of Indians who are in foreign jails for some reason or the other. Most of them are in Middle Eastern countries where a lot of people go to work. First is correct. India has such agreement with 31 countries where if Indians are, let's say, uh, in their jail, they will be sent to India, not set free, but they will serve their sentence in the Indian prison. Second is also correct. The Indian embassies, etc. have a welfare fund under which they help these citizens who are unable to get help if the case is genuine. Third is also correct. We are a member of these two conventions that talk about transfer of sentenced persons. So the answer here is three. The reason why this transfer basically takes place is that the person who is jailed might have family members in India. So family members can't go abroad to meet that person in prison. So at least if the person is in India, at least there are family members, uh, others can go and meet. That is the idea behind it. So the answer here is C. Next, consider the following statements with regards to nuclear installation in India and Pakistan. Number one. The agreement on prohibition of attack against nuclear installations and facilities was signed on December 31st, 1999 after the Kargil war. Second, the agreement mandated both the countries to inform each other about any nuclear installation and facilities to be covered under agreement on the 1st of Jan every calendar year. Third, According to the agreement, the term nuclear installation includes nuclear power, research stations, uranium enrichment, isotope separation, facilities, etc. Basically, India and Pakistan have an agreement under which on 1st of Jan every year, we exchange a list of nuclear power plants where they are so that in case of a problem between the two sides, we don't attack that place. That is the agreement. That's what the question is about. 
see if you can answer this read this carefully it's a long question then mark your answer done okay first the agreement was signed after kargil war no 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 much before that it came into being it was ratified in 1992 signed even earlier when rajiv gandhi was a prime minister but it was ratified later on in 1992 it came into force second that is true on 1st of jan every year we exchange information please understand the information exchange not about nuclear weapons no country tells other country where have we kept our nuclear weapons that is not the information we are giving them information is about nuclear power plants where nuclear fuel is now you might say why are we giving that information see this information anyway can be made available but it is a kind of a show in good faith that see we are giving you this information so don't attack anywhere near this place because it will be disastrous for not just us but for you as well as a neighboring countries they will also have the side effects of it so the two sides share this for confidence building purposes second and third are correct the answer here is b any two are correct the first statement here is wrong they said not after kargil war much much before that first statement is wrong next the ben gurion canal project recently in the news is a project that plans to connect with which of connect which of the two following water bodies so it's a connecting project between which of the two mediterranean sea with the gulf of aqaba andaman sea to the gulf of thailand indian ocean to the pacific ocean or none of the above it was in the news recently think about it ben gurion canal project if you don't know, i'll give you a hint the hint is ben gurion was the founding father of israel he is regarded as a founding father of israel now imagine where israel is and what the answer would be answer is a the mediterranean with the gulf of aqaba this is the canal project as you can see here so this is the suez canal and this is the supposed project with the mediterranean sea with the gulf of aqaba so it's about giving an alternate connectivity without using the suez canal suez canal is a very big source of revenue for egypt countries around the world are trying to find some other ways so that they can also earn this revenue the idea is how to go from mediterranean to the suez to the red sea that is the entire objective so to come to red sea basically israel is saying why not build a canal here we will build we will join this mediterranean with the gulf of aqaba and that is how you can have it so that is a project in the news it has not started so far this brings to the end of this class this was class number 1 of ir we have another class tomorrow do tell me in the comment section how many of these 25 did you get you can compare with others as well do join us tomorrow for 7 pm for the next class of this ir topics thank you so much bye bye jai hind